Okay, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Susan Salgado, who is in New York City today. How are you doing, Susan? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Excellent, excellent. And um, Susan has been helping businesses for over 20 years create an extraordinarily workplace culture. And she's done this across many, uh, many different industries. Um, so that's what we wanted to talk about today. And, and Susan, one of the questions, whenever the idea of culture comes up, I always ask people this. I mean, it's become a bit of a buzzword for some people yes, and yes. a lot of lip service. But what is it when, when you talk about creating a culture, what, what do you mean by that? That's my favorite question, John. <laughs> I believe that it really has become, um, it, it's not the same meaning today as it was when the original concept of organizational culture was first developed in management literature. And really, when you think about what culture is, the culture in an organization is no different than the culture in society, a culture in a family, the culture of a tribe. It's a, it's a sociological um, perspective. Right that I take on this. And so when you think about culture, this is really about the values and beliefs and traditions of an organization, but even more so, it's about what behavior is acceptable because that will define a culture at the end of the day. When you think about how we treat one another, anything from how we respond to emails, is it a curt response? Are we um, very thoughtful in setting up an email so that someone doesn't read a whole chain below or is it just see below? You know, the things that we do in how we treat each other in email, the um, way we talk to each other, um, the way organizations set up policies for their teams, um, all of this brings us to what is acceptable behavior. And that is what will define your culture. And so um, when people talk about ping pong tables and beer kegs and nap rooms, <laughs> Those are amenities, right? And they may be very good amenities to support certain types of cultures, but can you imagine J.P. Morgan having beer kegs in there? Right, yeah, yeah. You'd get, you'd, get some, you'd get some interesting financial It would advice. be, and it would be appropriate, <laughs> right? So it fits some organizations and not others, and you really have to develop a culture that fits who you are as a leader and what you're trying to achieve in your company. Yeah, I know. I, I, I love the way you pointed that out because I have seen, um, you know, a lot of people have gone, oh, look, they get foosball tables and, and right. massage chairs in Silicon Valley, so we should get some. And, right. for a mo and for a month, people use them and then they gather dust and people go, well, what happened with the culture? Here, um, one of the or, things... Sorry, go on. Sorry. Even more than that, sometimes it's really not acceptable. So they put in a beer keg, but people get and like, is it really okay to have a beer? I'm not sure. And yeah. so instead of um, uh, being an amenity that people enjoy, it becomes, like you said, covered with dust because people aren't sure if it's really acceptable. Only your culture can determine whether or not it will be acceptable to use. Yeah, and I often think too, I mean, if somebody puts a beer keg in, I'm like, well, could you just give me the money instead? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a lot of people say that. Yeah. Um, so one thing um, you, you touched on there that I, I want to come back to, so do you think, um, you know, because of there's so much electronic communication and virtual communication, I mean, that's, I, I think uh, in some ways, you know, people don't always understand how they come across electronically and that, um, but has that engendered a little bit of less tolerance, less kind of consideration by people? And it, because that seems to be quite pervasive in a lot of company cultures. It is, it is. And it's a very um, big defining feature of company cultures, which is why I brought it up. Mm -hmm. um, are you expected to check your email at two o'clock in the morning and respond, right? That's a, that's a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. So um, when a leader in an organization starts doing things like that, like I used to be the kind of person who liked to clean out my inbox every night. So my team would get emails at 11, 12 o'clock at night, and they felt like they had to respond. That wasn't my intention at all. I didn't mean for them to. I was just cleaning out my inbox, trying to get my job done. And what I realized is that I was setting a tone of people feeling like they were under pressure and had to respond very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, those kinds of behaviors that we exhibit, especially people in leadership roles, will set an example for everyone else that they think they have to follow. When it comes to the tone of emails, um, or even do you respond to an email saying, thanks, or I got it? Some companies feel like that just fills up people's inboxes. Don't reply if, if it's not an actually relevant email. Mm -hmm. And other companies, the culture says you should always thank someone for their response or for, or for mm -hmm. giving 
information. And so um, when I was working with Union Square Hospitality Group here in New York City, um, it was funny because we had a norm that you always responded. And when new people would join the company and they wouldn't respond, everyone thought, well, that's rude. I can't believe <laughs> they thank you. You know, they, these are the um, unwritten rules of an organization that define the culture and really need to be broken down for new people so that they can fit in. So what's interesting about that is, and I think it, and it, it's challenging in some ways, is a lot of these things happen organically, right? So, you know, a culture grows up organically because maybe, you know, the first people there were the ones who sent thanks to every email. But, yeah. but I mean, to your point then, you have to be deliberate in all of these things because otherwise it's guesswork, yeah? You do. The bigger you get, the more important it becomes to be very explicit about what those expectations are. And I have seen that once you get to about five people, the environment starts to change. When you get to 10, it's completely different again. And so every new level of um, employees you have in your organization requires more and more definition of what the culture is. It's great to just let it evolve naturally in the beginning, but once you get up to 10 to 20 employees, and I see this with a lot of startups, this is where they really start to intentionally think about what is the culture that we want to create and how are we going to articulate those expectations. And so they'll start writing manuals. You know, that's great. Manuals are and you're going to get some of that down. But as I said, there are always unwritten rules that we don't think about. We just do them. And it's not until a leader becomes self-aware enough to recognize the impact that they're having on their team that they'll really start to be able to define, ah, this is what I expect and this is what I'm seeing and I need to bridge that gap. So, so talk to me a little bit about, so a lot of, a lot of leaders face this um, challenge nowadays where they feel like the pendulum's going too far and it's, you know, it's like, oh, now I'm, I'm expected to pamper and, and mm -hmm. you know, pander to everything mm -hmm. my employees wants to keep them happy yeah. all the time. Um, so how do you strike that, how do you strike that balance when you talk to, to leaders? How do you strike a balance between actively working to make uh, employees happy, but not going to the point where you're like you're walking on eggshells around them. Right, right. That this goes again to the misconceptions about mm -hmm. culture. Culture is not about making everybody feel great at work all the time and making it a really happy workplace. It's about making work fulfilling and engaging and giving people a sense of pride in what they do. And so when you think about it, like you, you can read numerous studies that will say, when we look at what really makes employees happy, Mm -hmm. um, it isn't necessarily about those amenities. They can be really nice touches, but people want to feel valued and appreciated at work. And so um, the ability of a leader to be able to take care of the team in a way that makes you more successful, makes you better at your job. And sometimes that actually means giving them tough love. Mm -hmm. you know, difficult messages, right? I'm more on your side by telling you what you're doing wrong than by letting you do things wrong. Everybody else knows it and you're the only one who hasn't right. figured it out yet, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, accountability is a critical part of making all of this work. That misconception that I really have to coddle and, and care for people is um, ruining our ability to hold them accountable to higher standards. Great workers want to be great. And they feedback. And I hear it, you know, especially with today's generation, the millennials really push for that feedback. They've grown up with a lot of feedback. And, you know, the Gen Xers and above, we're not used to giving that much feedback. Some people say millennials want more feedback than anyone else. I don't agree with that. I think we all like to get feedback. It's just that previous generations didn't ask for it as much. Right. But when them feedback and help them to improve their performance, you're taking care of them and you're reinforcing a culture of we can take care of each other and still be um, the best that we can possibly be. Yeah, and I think that's a great point on, on the accountability. And so you're really creating a culture of results and success and people being the best they can, not, yeah. not, not coddling people. Um, yeah. So here's another interesting one, and, and it really speaks to what you were just talking about. So in, in times past, uh, in many ways, culture was seen as something 
that existed within the physical confines of a of a building of a headquarters of a company you know that's a company. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays um say even with our own organization we have some offices but we have a majority of us mm -hmm. are dis distributed right and remote mm -hmm. so uh, talk to me about building culture when you have either a hybrid remote organization right. or a completely remote organization yes Yes, a lot of my clients are in that boat and they're trying to balance the off-site with the on-site. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the greatest challenge that um, a lot of companies are facing is around the fun things that happen. So when you're in an office, you can surprise everyone with lunch. Or you can um, have a picnic in the afternoon or ice cream social. Those are great and they are feel-good activities for employees. And then the people who are off-site feel left out of that. Right. Mm -hmm. so is a place where if your culture is about creating this fun for everyone, mm -hmm. really on the leadership team to find ways to include offsite people in the fun. And that may not be that they're coming into the office um, to have to yeah. be part of the party, especially if they live far away. But can you plan for when people are going to be in the office? You know there's a big event going on. You know that we're gonna have a lot of offsite people coming in. Those are great days to choose to do some of these events. Or alternately, one of my clients actually sent out Starbucks gift cards to all of their offsite people on the same day that they had mm -hmm. a breakfast for the team. And so finding ways to just send a little something we're thinking about you out of sight does not mean out of mind. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to my original point. Those amenities are just one piece of this, right? Mm -hmm. It's more about how we treat each other. And so when you're in the office, do you actually think about the fact that, oh, so-and-so who's off-site really should be included in this conversation. Let's get them on the phone right now. Because when they're out of sight, we forget about them sometimes. And then they're not being included in really important discussions in the office. And so if your um, structure is to have off-site people, it requires you to be much more thoughtful about how you're going to include mm -hmm. everything from the fun activities through to the really important work that's going on on site. Yeah, and the other thing I think as well is then think about it then when you have a completely distributed organization, getting back to what you said earlier, then you probably need to, it's even probably even more critical that you set expectations. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have found ourselves, actually, it's funny you should mention that piece about because um, a lot of our organization in the States is, is remote, is that we actually include everybody more even than you probably would in the office because you're already on a virtual, you're on Slack or you're on, you're like, oh, let's add that person in. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting, but when you have a, a maybe a majority of, um, remote organization, I guess setting expectations is even more important, right? Yes. Yes, it really is, um, because they can't read the nuances of what's going on in the workplace. They're missing that visual piece, mm -hmm. just being in the office and feeling what's going on. And so you have to provide them with even more context. Um, I think if you can um, imagine what, oh, oh I, I'm sorry, what I was, where I was going to go with this is, if there is a way that when someone comes on board, you can have them hang at your office for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I've done, I've actually required new people on my team who are local enough to commute right. to spend six months in the office. Mm -hmm. I will allow them to become fully offsite because I think there is something to be said for catching the culture that's going on. You can't really teach culture. You can, mm -hmm. catch it. You, can you can set expectations, you can role model behavior, you can hold people accountable, but it's not really possible to just set out a bunch of rules and say right. the rules of the culture and now you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. But if you can encourage people to spend time on site, especially as they're onboarding in your organization, there's a lot of value in that. So what if you're an organization I mean, and you know, you're listening, you're watching this and you go, you know, I'm not really sure what kind of culture our organization has. And um, how do you assess or, or, or audit your own culture? Yeah, um, the, the key to all of this is what's most important to us as the leadership team. So whether it's a single founder or it's a small group of founders, um, you really need to be thinking about what's most important to us. Why do we exist? What do we, what's our purpose in the world? And um, What's important to us about how we get to that purpose? Because that getting to the purpose is going to help to define some of the behaviors that are most important to you. Um, and so when you think about um, creating the right set of behaviors for your team, you have to be very self-reflective. You have to be looking 
inside it. What are we doing and what's working here? And then how do we want to bring that to a larger group of people? Um, so I'm not sure, if, if there's a, there is a assessment kind of piece of this, but I think it's a lot more just about being um, reflective of your own behavior, what's important to you, and making sure that that is clear to everyone who's on your team. There's so many things we have going on in our heads that don't have our mouths. Right? Yeah, that's very true, very true. Yeah. Um, so where have you seen, um, in, the, in the work that you have done, where have you seen a, a real transformation in, in culture that's really kind of led to greater success of an organization? I mean, you don't have to name the company, but what are some mm -hmm. of the, what are some of the um, traits or outcomes of that? Ah, so the traits and the outcomes that I see in organizations that are successful um, is a, um, a higher level of collaboration and ownership that leads to greater results. People who are really invested in their workplace are going to go above and beyond naturally. They're going to perform just because they want to, not because they're required to or being compensated to. It's a more, um, it's, it's intrinsic rather than an extrinsic um, behavior. Um, but in these organizations, what I see, some of the telltale marks for me when I know that it's really going to work is when you have leadership from the top down who are invested in creating a caring and transparent workplace where people will feel valued and appreciated, not like they're just another number. And you can tell, like when I observe organizations, but part of my process of mm -hmm. um, a culture myself is to go in and spend time in the organization and I can go into a meeting and tell you so much about the organization just by watching how people arrive what they do once they get there the early ones do they talk to other people coming in or do they open up their laptop and start working um, when you watch um, how they um, transition into the meeting so okay now it's time to start you've got latecomers is the always on time or is this an organization where everything's always five minutes late like you can tell a lot just from watching the setup and then once the meeting starts do people really listen to each other are they taking it in are they collaborating or um, if there are differing opinions can they have a disagreement in a mutually respectful way are people on their phones so many telltale signs just from watching a meeting mm -hmm. and when you um, think about all of those types of behaviors, that's really what makes up the culture. And so when you say like, how do you assess this and, and create the culture that you want? Look at what everyone's doing. Right. Sit back and watch for a while. You will learn so much about your organization. Yeah, I, I love that. There's another thing that you mentioned there about being transparent, right? Mm -hmm. And I think every, it's like, it's like candor, right? Uh, I think everybody says, you know, I would love, you know, I really want to work in a transparent organization, one mm -hmm. where it's candid and, you know, people are forthright. But then they, they, they like that when it works kind of in their favor, when it's nice, yeah. but when it's, when the transparency or the candor shines a light on something to do with them that maybe isn't as positive, they don't like it so much. Yes. So you have to, you, yes. so people have to understand what transparency and candor mean, right? Yes, and it takes a lot of courage to be that transparent and a lot of trust in the organization because if I share with you the trials and the tribulations, if I'm honest with my team about why we're making certain changes and what we're grappling with, a lot of times I think leaders are afraid of scaring the team. The mm -hmm are not what we expected them to be. We're going to have to cut some programs or cut some benefits. And they just cut them and don't really offer much of an explanation and think that that's protecting themselves or the team from knowing the bad news. Right. Your team's probably a lot smarter than that. You know something's <laughs> going on. And so when um, they start to put the pieces together, they'll actually spend more time ruminating on that and trying to figure out what's happening than doing their work because right. there's a of transparency um we're hiring great people they're adults like share the news with them good and bad and be honest about what you're going through um, it really builds enormous trust and commitment from your team and you'd be surprised what people do to try to help in those situations rather than um the opposite you know when they're sitting back and getting frustrated so it seems like, uh, you know, from a leadership point of view, then courage and honesty, they're, they're premium if you want to have yes. the right kind of culture. Yes. My other two favorite qualities in leaders are humility mm -hmm. 
That's, I mean, that's a touchy one. Daniel Pink just wrote an article this week. I don't know if you saw. It was very interesting about humility and the upside and downside of it. Um, humility does not mean being weak. Mm -hmm. Humility means being open and um, learning from others, believing that you can learn something from any person that you meet, and knowing that two heads are better than one. If we talk it out, we're probably going to get to a better decision. Mm -hmm. And that kind of humility takes a lot of courage because it means I don't always have the right answers. Sure. You know how they say um, in leadership, it's very, very lonely up at the top. Yes, and, exactly. And that's because we feel like we can't talk to people. The more we're open and transparent, I think the better. Um, second quality that I love is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. People really understand themselves and how they come across. They're going to be a much better leader. You have to know how your behaviors, your moods, your energy impacts your team if you want to be a really effective leader. Yeah, and that's actually, as we finish up here, that's actually one of my one of my favorites. I, I think across, and not just leaders, across everyone, I think self-awareness is so critical. Yes. It's something, but it's something you can't teach people, and it's really mm -hmm. hard. I've always found it in my career. Um, you know, I've been through periods of having to become more self-aware, and it's not, it's sometimes not always pleasant. Um, right. But I've found that if you have people, you know, working for you or working with you who lack self-awareness, it's really tough. Yes, it is. Um, I have had the benefit, like you, I've had to learn self-awareness on my own. I don't think you can specifically teach it to someone. Mm -hmm. Do learn self-awareness if we're open to it. If we have a very, if we have a very defensive kind of presence and we're always trying to protect ourselves, then you're unlikely to be able to learn. Mm -hmm. But my greatest gifts in my career came from a colleague who, when I first joined an organization, I was brand new, nobody knew me, but he did. And he sat with me in a meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he said to me, are you okay? <laughs> Said, yeah, why? And he said, because you looked so angry in that meeting. <laughs> oh my gosh, no, I was just listening. And mm. I guess I have a furrowed brow, you know. <laughs> and um, for me, it was my thinking face, but for him, he saw anger. And if he hadn't told me that day, I would have gone to dozens of other meetings and had everyone think that I was mean or angry, right? Uh, yeah. Until we have. Um, colleagues and friends and family who are willing to help us see those things and until we're really ready to hear them ourselves, mm -hmm. it's very hard to build self-awareness. Yeah, I yeah, know. I agree. I, and that's, that's, a, that's a great example. But yeah, I agree. I agree completely. It is, it is one of the toughest things. And, but it is also, in my mind, if you can actually open yourself up to being more self-aware, your, your situation will change so dramatically. Yes. It does. It really does. I've seen it many times. Well, listen, Susan, this has been fantastic. We're bumping up against the end of, time, end of our time. But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can oh, learn sure. more about you and get in contact with you. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I am based out of New York City. I spent um, 18 years of my career working with Danny Meyer of Union Square Hospitality Group, where first I was the director of culture and learning for his restaurants and then subsequently founded a consulting firm under the umbrella of his organization that helped not restaurants, but rather companies across all industries that were looking for ways to create remarkable workplaces that would lead to remarkable customer experiences. And um, today I am an independent consultant. I do have a website, susansalgado.com. Uh, so that would be the best way to learn more. And um, I am really loving the career of helping companies to create better workplaces because I think it truly does make the world a better place if we love the work that we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more because if we love the work that we do, then the customer experience is going to reflect and that. All results do. Yeah, yeah. It, really, it really is reflective of how we're feeling about our jobs. All right. Well, listen, thanks. Uh, thanks, Susan. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.